Hello, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to the CMS Colloquium of this week. Today, we are very glad to have Professor Yanxi Richard Tsai from UT Austin as our speaker. Professor Tsai obtained his PhD from UCLA in 2002 after holding a joint position between Princeton University and the Institute of Advanced Study. He joined UT Austin in 2004, where he remains today. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Richard Tsai, who will tell us today about side effects of learning from embedded low dimensional data. Well, thank you for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so you see the title of what I'm going to talk about. And this is essentially one of the, the projects that I, uh, you know, I, I have in order to try to get involved and understand, uh, you know, the business of uh, deep learning. Okay. And um, well, to be honest, I was a little bit surprised to get the invitation, uh, particularly after inspecting the previous uh, uh, lecture. So I was a little bit uh, hesitant and exchanged some emails with uh, with Du. Um, so I hope that um, you know uh, you guys will get something you know out of my talk today and will find the uh, this thing uh, that I will present interesting. Okay. So uh, uh, I would like to start with an example. Um, so I'm pretty sure that uh, you guys have seen these images. So what you see here is uh, you know a couple of hand written hand written digits. Um, that is published um, in a database uh, by the National Institute of Standards, uh, I think NIST. Uh, and this data set is, is called MNIST data set. So you have, uh, so we have 10 uh, digits from zero, one, two, to all the way to, the, to nine. And they collected uh, for each digit, they, they collected quite a few number of uh, handwritten uh, variations of these things in the form of images. And these images are then, you know, uh, I think the most common version of this data set would be that each image uh, will, 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 will have, uh, will correspond to, um, you know, a matrix of uh, 28 by 28 pixels, that entries. Um, and uh, each element in this matrix will be, or each pixel in the image will be either zero, either zero or one. So you see this kind of black and white images like that. Um, and, um, uh, so the 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 ob objective, of course, is to uh, let's say pipe in this image into uh, some algorithm, and this algorithm will decide uh, uh, you know uh, which digit uh, is contained in this digit. So of course here you see uh, there's a three. So ideally, if you come up with an algorithm, and this you know when you input this into your algorithm, then the algorithm will say, okay, with high probability, uh, this image contains a digit which is uh, three like that. And of course, you see the applications when, uh, when the post office try to process, you, you, you know, mails and uh, postal codes, etc. Well, so the, so um, I guess the point is that, um, so each one of this image is regarded as a point in very high dimensions, Euclidean space, because you uh, typically it's regarded just as a, as a vector in uh, 784 dimensions. So it's a point. And associated with this point, there will be what people call a label. So that label would be, okay, it's a three, and this is an eight, and this is a six, et cetera. Um, but then if you think about this a little bit uh, you know, uh, more, then you say that, hey, I have somebody who, who wrote uh, these kind of, uh, uh, who, who wrote uh, you know, these uh, uh, numbers. And I could digitize each one of the numbers into now it's a 20, you know, into images of 28 by 28 pixels. But I can also use higher resolution images to represent, you know, these images. So, um, uh, so if you do uh, say, uh, if you, for each one of the uh, digits over here, if you use 280 by 280 uh, images, image, then um, you embed this handwritten digit into a much uh, higher uh, Euclidean space, higher dimensional Euclidean space. Now, um, you, have, you have collected so many uh, handwritten uh, digits, you digitize them, you choose the, so here people choose to digitize it, uh, each image as 28 by 28 pixel image. And so it's uh, these, so you, you get a dis distribution of points in uh, 
uh, 784 dimensions. If you choose higher resolution images, then you will have distributions of points in you know, higher, much higher dimensional Euclidean spaces. Um, and it seems that this kind of uh, embedding uh, is a little bit arbitrary, right? So you go from uh, lower dimensions uh, to higher dimensions. Um, so uh, this is, uh, you know, kind of our first uh, um, uh, kind of uh, observation. Right? So you have it, you you have hand written rigid hand bit, you you have these uh, handwritten figures, and they are digitized. Uh, in some sense, arbitrarily, somebody makes a decision that now we're going to create a data set, uh, embed them into this kind of space like that. Now, um, <clears throat> if you if one uh, you know. Uh, if one try to, uh, to try to analyze the distribution of these uh, uh, images from this uh, published data set, uh, you know, one can use, uh, you know, probably the most basic uh, um, algorithm to understand this, uh, you know, as a first uh, attempt. And this uh, kind of algorithm is called principal component analysis. So um, on the lower left corner, you see a, a distribution of uh, blue points. Um, and suppose you find the center of mass of these distribution of points and you anchor it. And then you, uh, so then you, uh, so each one of the points could be regarded as a vector, you know, uh, with the origin at the center of the mass like that. Uh, and then you create a, a matrix, which is called the correlation matrix of this, uh, uh, these uh, vectors like that. And you perform singular value decomposition. So what you will find out is, uh, you know, uh, a set of orthogonal directions uh, here depicted here we see only two because everything is projected into 2D um, and associated with each, uh, each one of the orthogonal directions, there's a strength, it which is the singular values that's being found by the singular value decomposition algorithms. The strength of these singular values will tell you approximately how, you know, these, uh, the, the, your distribution of points uh, distribute how the, the variance of these uh, distribution of points in each one of the subspaces pointed, uh, defined by, by these orthogonal directions like that. Now, um, so on the right two columns, uh, you see uh, the, the result of, uh, uh, of uh, this principal component analysis. In the middle column, you see the principal uh, component analysis applied to uh, those images or those data points in, in R784, uh, which correct to, uh, which corresponds to the digit number zero. Now, what you see here is that the, the strength, so the, uh, the, you know, the magnitude of these arrows decay very fast. So this is, uh, if you put it on a log scale, you see that, yeah, it does decay very fast. And, you know, approximately, you, you know, with, with, with uh, 40 dimensions, 40 orthogonal directions, you capture a lot of the, 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 the variations uh, in the hand, you know, in the, in the distribution of uh, corresponds to digit zero already. Uh, so what happened to the rest of 740-ish uh, uh, dimensions? Well, essentially the points, you know, they're just free. And then if you look at the distribution of all the, you know, containing all the digits, uh, you see, you know, it exhibit the same kind of decay. Um, you can even see that, uh, you, you know, maybe with a little bit more principal components, you reach the same level. You covered uh, the same amount of variance, variations like that. So this kind of suggests that uh, this MNIST data sets for hand digit, did, did, written digit can be probably approximated by much lower dimensional uh, subspaces of uh, this uh, uh, R784 uh, space like that. Uh, can I ask a quick so, question? So sure. for the uh, bottom left figure, uh, what yeah. are the coordinates? So the coordinate is, so, uh, so that's imagine that this is R784. And the first step you do is, uh, uh, you know, you compute the, the the center of mass of this uh, each one of the each one of these vectors. Mm, but so for this, uh, it would yes. be like uh, either zero or one, right? But but uh... essentially, you know, the components in the in the vectors 
would be either zero and one. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some pixels which will, will, will be in between, but most of them, it will be zero and one. So then yes. you just average them, right? And you average them that you will, you will get uh, this center of mass. So th this is not a precise projection of this. This is just a, you know, kind of a- Oh, you know, I see, I see. Uh -huh. This is just an illustration that uh, kind of uh, is an attempt to, to illustrate how this principal component analysis works. Basically, basically, you find the center of mass, and then you 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 uh, form some kind of projection made you know operator, and then you look at the 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 actions of this operator. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Using the value decomposition. I see, I see. And for the uh, figure in the middle, uh, upper middle, so uh, the highest ratio is like a point uh, seven, and that's the ratio between the second uh, principal component uh, versus the first. Is that right? I, I, um, Okay, to be honest, I, I think this is normalized. So if you, uh -huh. I, I think uh, you will have, you will find 784 orthogonal directions. And in yeah. each of the directions, you will find, you know, uh, a singular value like that. And this is normalized mm -hmm. this way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see, thanks. Um, so, so that you, you know the relative strength of these things. Okay, um, should I go, go on? Uh, go yes, on. please. Yes. Okay. So then we kind of acknowledge, uh, yeah, indeed, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, the, the reason that there, so this database is uh, maybe of lower dimensional nature and somehow they're embedded into this kind of uh, uh, Euclidean space of uh, dimension 784. Now, um, you know, uh, if you talk to, uh, you know, people in the community, then there's some people will mention uh, something which is called a low, the low dimensional manifold hypothesis, uh, which is uh, related to uh, some people believe that, you know, let's say the distribution of natural images, for example, or a lot of this kind of data that we gather uh, in the field, they are actually, you know, a lower dimensional feet, you know, it, they're not really, they are, most of the time they are of artificially embedded into some really high dimensional Euclidean space just for convenience. But uh, in re reality, they might concentrate on a much lower dimensional manifold somehow embedded in, in this kind of uh, Euclidean space. So this is a lower dimensional man manifold hypothesis. And, and some people think that because of this thing, this, uh, this kind of uh, lower dimensional feature, one can try to extract information um, in a more, uh, you know, efficient way. You know that does not depend on the 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 uh, the dimensionality of the embedding space. Um, and then you can find, you know, so we just we just saw this uh, application of principal component analysis. There are more elaborate uh, algorithms with, uh, that are created to understand the geometry of these data points uh, in some sense. Uh, and these are called uh, manifold learning algorithms. So MDS stands for multidimensional scaling. And this is more elaborate one uh, called TSNE. And then there's also uh, something that rely on, um, you know, uh, uh, diffusion map. Um, and then there's also, uh, you know, a fundamental theorem, which is called johnson lindenstrauss theorem, that tells you that, well, um, you can, you know, if, if you are, uh, it, it is possible to find some projection of high dimensional data points uh, uh, into a low dimensional uh, subspace, uh, which approximately preserves the pairwise Euclidean distances. Um, like that, and and this theorem uh, has found application in a lot of uh, uh, you know scenarios, um, and uh, in the context of uh, machine learning and uh, in particular deep learning, you know there are success uh, algorithms and architectures, uh, neural network architectures that you know that that is uh, related to uh, the concept of um, uh, an auto encoder or enco uh, encoder decoder structure. Um, and uh, the lower right um, cartoon shows you what's going on. Um, I choose to reverse the order of a, a typical presentation because that's closer to what we will write in mathematics. So on the right, you have the input vector. So imagine that this is, a, this is that image, one of those images uh, in the data set that we just, uh, we just uh, saw. And you... Um, you put into uh, this, Im you input this image into a neural network, which is denoted over here. And then uh, after a few layers, uh, they would reduce the dimensionality 
uh, uh, into something which is called uh, a latent space. And this latent space will, will, will depend, will, will only have a few, uh, you know, the dimensions, the dimensions of this latent space, which would be much smaller than the dimensions of, uh, uh, of you know, of, the, uh, of your input vector, uh, of the space where you're, you, you draw your input vector. So, um, so these are called latent space and latent variables. And, you know, the successful thing is that you somehow through the, the, the context of uh, appropriate uh, supervised learning, you find the hidden lower dimensional features from your distribution of input vectors. And they are encoded in, with much fewer degrees of freedom and in, in the so-called latent space. And uh, it, it has proven uh, successful in uh, you know, quite a few applications. And afterwards, um, you can use these uh, uh, latent variable to do different tasks so this part, the path from a lower dimensional latent space into a higher dimensional, uh, formerly higher dimensional output space uh, is called the decoder part. Uh, and if you have heard something called transfer learning, one, one of the scenarios in transfer learning will be, first you, in, you, 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 uh, you train your neural network in this way, and these are all particular inf, you know, uh, weights or parameters that you found through optimization. And afterwards, you keep this part um, believing that this describes the essential information from your data sets. And then you would train uh, the, the, the decoder part to do different tasks um, like that. So the next uh, page just shows you, uh, you know, a, a couple, you know, some, uh, some figures that I found from the internet related to the visualization of these kind of uh, manifold learning algorithms. Uh, and so, I, I, I think here each color uh, represents um, a different uh, digits. And then you see that, uh, you know, even, you know, looking at it in 3D, projecting these data points in 3D after these learning algorithms, the data points are uh, corresponding to different digits. They are, you know, they are, they lie on, they have some structure going on. And, and it seems that the structure is lower dimensional like that. They vary because these they, they, these are different algorithms relying on different ideas in processing these uh, these uh, data points. Now that's the uh, that will finish the in introduction. Um, so uh, to put uh, the following discussion uh, in a more concrete um, set setting, so uh, that's that's considered the following a, a simpler situations. So we have so we are given a function or we we want to. Um, we want to come up with a um, with, with some approximation of this function f, which is defined on on a, which is a real value function defined um, on a, a manifold M, which is embedded in a high dimensional uh, Euclidean space. So the dimensionality of M is uh, much smaller, assumed to be smaller than uh, you know the embedding space M. Um, so the information uh, that you have about this function would be through uh, what is called, uh, you know, the, the, your data data sets. So here denoted by D, and it's a pair data set. So uh, for every point in X or every sample point, uh, every point that you sample from this uh, data manifold M, uh, you know the value. You assume that you know the value of f of uh, of f at that particular point. Um, so, uh, so this means that typically your data, your, your data set here would be, you know, actually a finite set, right? Uh, but here, just for convenience, I, I write it this way. So now the objective is to create, um, you know, constructively, uh, you, you want to create another function, f sub theta, okay? And this uh, f sub theta would be, in this talk, would, would most, most of the time would, would correspond to some kind of uh, neural network. Where theta is a notation that we use to say that you know uh, it, it is a set uh, uh, corresponding to a lot of the uh, corresponding to the parameters that we use to define this function, um, and this function will be formally a, a real value function mapping a, a point in R M uh, you know to R like that. So um, in the context of deep learning, what people usually do is you want to you know, this is a generalization of least square approximation, uh, right? So you want to come up with a function in certain function space, right? And so that uh, when you evaluate the L2 distance 
uh, L2 difference between uh, the weighted L2 dif uh, difference between uh, your uh, approximation to the real function, uh, you want to find this, uh, you know, one, one, one function that minimizes this difference like that. Uh, so that, and, and this space, this function space N sub theta will, det will be determined on how you set up your neural network, uh, including the, sh the, you know, the shape of the network uh, and the number of parameters uh, and the actions that's associated with it. Um, so um, in practice, this function, your neural, your, the function defined by your neural network, will, the, the optimizer will be constructed by uh, some kind of uh, gradient descent based uh, optimization procedure. So you think about this as a functional and then you, 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 you just uh, apply a gradient flow, um, you know, trying to minimize uh, this, this functional. And uh, you stop at some point and uh, the, the set of parameters uh, that you get it will be denoted by theta sub, sub uh, theta star, which denotes the optimal uh, uh, parameter set, uh, which uh, in turns define your optimal uh, approximation uh, to F like this. And um, hopefully, uh, and in this talk, we'll assume that uh, after you successfully solve this optimization problem, um, your function, the function that you construct when, when restricted onto this data manifold would be sufficiently close uh, to the function that you want to approximate. Now, our question doesn't stop here. So our question is uh, what happened? So when, you know, after training, so this, uh, so when people say that you train a neural network, it refers to, you know, running an optimization procedure to find this in the hope to find an, an optimizer, uh, of, you know, F theta star. So after you train and, and get a, a good neural network um, uh, that, that, that satisfy this, uh, this uh, conditions over here, um, it, it, there are classical, uh, there are practical situations you say uh, where you, when you, you actually want to evaluate this function that you just construct, um, you know, on some data, on some points, which is uh, kind of close to your data manifold, but not exactly on the data manifold. So we will denote this, uh, uh, this situation, you know, this set of points, uh, we want to ev evaluate them um, on some, some other manifold M prime, which is kind of close to M, but not precisely M like that. And here you see an F bar. So why is this, uh, why is there an F bar? So this F bar denotes some extension of F you know, because ideally we started out by assuming that we have a function which is strictly, the, you know, just a function from, from M to R, right? So we should have, we have no information about uh, how this function should be or can be extended, uh, you know, uh, away from M. And here uh, F bar would denote, uh, you know, some extension of uh, this function away from, from, from this, uh, the original data manifold M like that. And we have, what we have in mind is just a constant long, constant uh, extension in along the normal directions of uh, this uh, data manifold M like that. And we assume of course that the M, this M is a sufficiently smooth uh, manifold. So now from training, we assume that we can construct a neural network that gives you uh, this kind of good performance. Uh, so the question is, uh, so if you have that, does that guarantee, or what can we say about, you know, uh, this situations when we try this error over here, when we try to evaluate this function on a distribution of points sample from some manifold that's nearby the original data manifold like that. So I guess, you know, it, it is natural then to say that, you know, the first step that we take would be, uh, try to figure out what is the normal derivative so, or how does F theta star change in the normal directions um, uh, to, the, to, the, to the original data manifold. So that becomes uh, the, the priority of this talk. Now, um, I want to say a few words, uh, you know, just to make sure that uh, we're on the same page. Uh, so uh, what are these, uh, how do these, the function F star look like? Right. Um, so in general, um, we are considering a class of uh, neural networks, which are called feed forward neural network, which means that the information is flowing only in one direction. So here from right to left. Um, and, you know, these functions, uh, this class of functions can be defined recursively in the, in very, uh, in, in the following very simple form. 
So um, you start out from the input like this, and then among, so L, you know, L denotes information from one layer to the, uh, to the next layer. So this is the L0 layer, this is L1 layer, et cetera, like that. Um, so each arrow over here uh, denotes an affine transform, uh, which is uh, written here like this. So there's a matrix multiplied to the value, uh, uh, to the vectors, right, uh, over here. And then you, you apply a shift. So this B, uh, you know, in the, in the community, people call this a bias. So this is an affine transform. So after doing a, uh, apply an affine transform to the, to the input vector, then you are going to uh, pass, you, you're going to pass this, the, the resulting vector to a nonlinear function, uh, which is called the uh, activation function. So here it's denoted uh, by sigma sub L, like that. And then you, you repeat the same, uh, you know, procedures. Very simple, but of course, from layer to layer or between layers, uh, you you have different uh, affine transform like this, and uh, the theta, the set of parameters uh, that we we have seen earlier, uh, refers to the co collection of these matrices and biases um, that you use in your uh, in defining the, the the affine transforms needed. So that this is uh, you know how. Um, this describes the, the class of functions that, that uh, you know, we will be working with like that. Okay, so now uh, some additional assumptions um, in order to get some more concrete analysis going on. So we have, uh, you know, labeled data pairs. So now, you know, I put a subscript n to, to, the, to the notation to the data set, denoting that we have n data points. So this, this is X and for whatever reason, you know, I change uh, from F of X I to G I. So G I is the function that we want to, uh, G of X is the, the function that we want to approximate and G I would be just uh, the value of the function uh, at the data point X I. And uh, furthermore, we assume that, uh, so we're gonna write it in the following way. So uh, each data points would have, uh, two components, uh, you know, so xi and then this sigma yi, imagine that when, so when sigma equals to zero, so this will be saying that your data points will lie on some kind of, you know, lower dimensional subspace of the, uh, of, uh, of these, uh, of this Euclidean space. Um, and the first block over here uh, would be, you know, r dx. So this will be the uh, dimension of the data manifold. And then the and then the, the remaining uh, uh, dimensions uh, is denoted here by r d sub y, like that. And um, when you when we multiply a sigma in front of this one, we will, we will assume that uh, you know these are uh, used to model the uh, some noise in your data set, uh, you know, in the direction that's you know uh, transversal to 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 this data manifold like that. And the uh, uh, capital X and capital Y denotes just some distributions in this data space, like that. And uh, for generality, you know, you know, we can our analysis actually is uh, applies when uh, you know this vector when, when you apply a unitary transform to this vector. But you know, for the remaining of this talk, we'll just assume since you know the analysis they carry out uh, you know without any problem, so we would just assume that this unitary transform is just identity. So it's just get rid of unnecessary, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, notations, etc. Um, and uh, additional assumptions would be, let's say, on the correlation of your data distribution. Um, so this is uh, the expectation of this correlation matrix is invertible. And then, you know, when you when you average your, you know, each one of the data, each one of x i times x i transpose, this has full rank. So this means that you know this should, when you apply uh, a principal component analysis to this distribution over here, you will have significant you know variations in in every directions in R D X like that. So which means that you cannot further reduce the lower dimensionality assumptions that we made over here. Okay, um, why? So in this talk, we'll assume that y comes from a normal distribution. And then we'll use this notation, which is, is commonly used in certain communities. So uh, the, the, uh, the average uh, of, uh, of some data points, zi, uh, you know, is denoted here, you know, with 
when you have n points. So this is the empirical mean. And then the mean, when you pass uh, n to infinity, this will be the true expectation, converge to the true expectation uh, of this, uh, uh, this uh, random variable z. Now, uh, the first thing we do is we look at the simplest possible situation, and hopefully that will reveal already some peculiar features about you know, uh, uh, learning in this particular setup. The, particular feature of uh, that comes out from uh, your data manifold being lower dimensional uh, embedded in high dimensions. So we look at linear regression, which means that we're looking for a linear function of x, y. These are the w, x and w, y are the weights in, uh, you know, when you try to define your functions, right? So we are looking for a linear function uh, which approximate this function um, on, with, with a given uh, data point. So, you, you, so this is a least square approximation. And then, um, of course, once you solve this problem, you find uh, the optimal weight sets, Wx star Wf, uh, W star Y, then, and then you will have your optimal linear approximation to these things, in this sense, optimal in this sense, like that. So the question of what, how does uh, F change in the, in, you know, in the direction normal to uh, your data manifold is uh, in this simple, simple setup would be just DF dy, uh, because Y would be the normal direction, DF dy uh, equals to W star, uh, WY star like that. So what is WY star? Now, the first thing that we, you know, we can easily see is that uh, if there's no noise in the Y direction, um, and, uh, and you somehow use a gradient descent to, to try to you know, e evolve um, to an optimal weight set. Then um, this weight set, W, Y star, is actually uh, not going to change along the, gradient uh, the, the process of gradient flow because uh, you always multiply in your data set sigma equals to zero. So uh, you, there's no variation that can be seen from this one. So uh, we in, in this case, we, we noticed that, uh, well, then this set of weights uh, is not trainable it, just because your data doesn't allow the, uh, them to be C and doesn't allow you to measure how uh, varying those parameters will change the output of your, uh, of your constructed function F theta like that. Okay, now suppose sigma is not zero then you can solve this, you can solve it easily, and there's a unique minimizer, uh, and the minimizing, um, the, the unique uh, pro minimizing uh, parameters are uh, written down over here, um, and this is how it should be, in particular when n goes to infinity, you know, this is just how it should be. Um, I want to draw your attention to the blue part of the formula uh, for the, the optimal weight set for uh, Wy star. So you notice here, there's this one over sigma times square root of n, like this. And sigma, the way we set it up, imagine that you know, y count is drawn from a, a, a normal distribution. So sigma is the standard deviation of, of your noise in the normal directions. And what this says is that um, you can control, you can control uh, how your uh, learning function f theta uh, behaves in the y direction, in the direction normal to the data manifold, uh, provided that you have a lot of data points and uh, that this data point, the number of data points that you have, have to make this um, quantity small. So assuming that you have fixed variance, uh, so sigma star, you have a fixed standard deviation in your, your data, then your data points have to scale at least, you know, inversely proportional to the variance of your, of your data, of the noise in the normal directions. So that's the first observation that we have. And you will see that the, this, this uh, property here will persist later on to more complicated situations. So the next step is to analyze um, you know, a, a, a more general setup, uh, which is a linear, a set of linear neural network. So what I meant is that, um, so we're, we're looking at uh, particular functions uh, uh, defined this way, um, where the, the final weight set, this lowercase w, is the multiplication of uh, 
of, um, of uh, quite a few number of uh, matrices in between. So each one of these matrices corresponds to the weight set connecting to two adjacent layers like that. Uh, when you multiply all of them together, you get this one. So in other words, you can say that the, the, the final weight set here is factorized into a multiplication of multiple uh, matrices like that. Now you have two views. You can view um, the construction of, uh, of uh, this function uh, two ways. The first way is to regard it as, uh, you know, for any fixed X, you regard it as a function of all these matrices, all these intermediate matrices. So then um, you set up your least square problem, then you will get a functional, uh, which depends on uh, these, uh, in, you know, uh, these weight sets like that. And the other way is to say that, okay, well, I'm just gonna look at my loss function or this uh, functional here uh, as uh, after I multiply all of them together. And this is the way set lowercase w. And you can view, view it like this. So this simpler view um, you know, is, uh, corresponds to, to directly what we have seen in the previous page. Um, and I would denote this setup to be uh, you know, with a superscript E. Um, and uh, in the original paper, uh, where we find this thing, it's it, you know this this weight set is called the end to end weight set, and this is the intermediate ones, like that. So the interesting thing is the following: um, if you try to minimize uh, the first functional, if you try to minimize j uh, through gradient descent with respect to all each each one of the entries in each one of the matrices over here. And subject to, so, so this is the gradient descent formally written this way, subject to uh, a condition that these weights, the initial conditions for these matrices satisfy certain conditions. Then you can, you can derive um, a dynamical system. You can derive an ODE for, um, for this guy along the gradient descent fl uh, flow of uh, the, the gradient flow of, uh, of, the, of this one. And this is written like this. It involves it, so it becomes, so there's a, there's a weighting over here that depends on the number of layers that's going on over here. And then there's this, uh, the, the gradient of uh, this guy with respect to the end-to-end -end weight. And then there's also some kind of uh, projection going on. And uh, this projection will be weighted uh, also to, uh, uh, by the num you know, by L minus one, also related, relate back to how many layers you have. Gotten. And this was, uh, you know, um, this equation was uh, derived in the paper by these three gentlemen, uh, Baralis in Princeton. Uh, I don't know the, uh, where the other people are uh, nowadays. So this is uh, found there like that. So, <clears throat> so in the 2018 paper by Aurora and his uh, collaborators, so, the, you know, in the deriv you know, in deriving these equations over here, they kind of, you know, you can say that they, they kind of address the question, you know, how does the end-to-end -end weight set uh, change along the gradient descent direction? So that is just described by the ODEs that we just saw in the previous page. Now we come in by saying that what happened uh, to uh, let's say what happened to the to the solution to this ODE for W uh, for this end-to-end -end weight set when it is, you know, when we have, uh, you know, the, the data points distributed in this particular way, like that. And then we further, we can try to answer some questions related to how does the, 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 the depth, how many layers you have uh, in, you know, in between uh, will affect the training process, meaning will the, what, what is the training process will refer to, you know, what happened to the dynamical system defined by the gradient descent flow, and then, uh, you know, what happened to the optimized uh, parameter set in this particular setup. So it turns out that, uh, you know, you know we, we can understand this thing uh, relatively well by, you know, the, looking at the, the following phase uh, portraits over here. So um, the picture over here, uh, you know, shows you, uh, so the horizontal axis, so we, so for now, we imagine that we're working on in the uh, two dimensions case. So the horizontal axis re re uh, refers to the WX, and the vertical axis refers to wy, and you know again, you know wy will correspond to the normal derivative of the function that we created. Um, when you have um, 
when, when there's no noise in the normal direction, so when sigma equals to zero, then you see that uh, there is a, so there is a, for that dy dynamical system, there is a stationary manifold, which is de depicted here by the, the white chalk line over here. So, which means that, uh, it just means that, uh, you, you know, um, you, can, you have no control of uh, how your, uh, the, the WY would be. Any WY would be good. You know, if you start out over here, you know, you will get to somewhere over here like that. Um, you have no control of it. It depends on the initial conditions. Now, in the, when, when sigma uh, is not zero, then this stationary, stationary manifold kind of degenerate into a slow manifold that may have some curvatures going on like that. And uh, the pink, uh, uh, the, the pink purple dot or the light purple dot over here will, will correspond to uh, the minimizer when you have enough sufficient number of data points. So WY will be sufficiently close to zero, right? So WY will be sufficiently close to zero and, and uh, WX will be sufficiently close to ideally what, what, what should be. Now, you, if you start out from uh, initialize your weight set so, so that you landed in, in this part of the, the, the square, then it will take you like this until you get to somewhere close to the slow manifold. And then you start to, to travel very, very slow. Uh, it takes on a different time scale, slow time scale, uh, when you finally are attracted to a, a, a reasonably small neighborhood of this optimizer like that. Now, when, you're, when, you, when you initialize somewhere over here, what's going to happen is that you're going to be attracted to uh, the origin to a, some small neighborhood of the origin. And this is due to the, to the presence of, uh, of this guy, this factor over here. You, you're gonna be attracted to, um, to, the, to, to a small neighborhood of the, uh, of the origin and you're gonna spend a very long time another time scale that's related to the one over the, uh, the, the standard deviation of your noise before you escape and get attracted over here and then spend another very long time to, to get down uh, in the process of uh, you know, reducing the magnitude of W sub Y like that. Now, if you initialize your points on this side of the, this half space, right? Um, then things are simpler. You simply are attracted over here uh, to here and then you spend some time, long time to get down. But there's no hidden surprise that you will be kind of trapped in a, in a small neighborhood around the origin if you start out over here. So if you read out the theorems that we are able to prove, then we, you know, uh, this is obvious, right? The first bullet point is obvious that there's a spurious stationary point at zero. And, uh, you know, the, the, the stationary manifold, this white line will degenerate into a slow manifold when sigma uh, is not zero. Um, and, uh, you know, the non-spurious stationary uh, point, which is, which is depicted here by this pink, uh, pink dot over here, uh, how close it is to, uh, uh, to zero, you know, the, the Y component is, uh, is, how close the Y component is to zero depends on how many data points you have. And this is directly related to, uh, you know, our simple exercise uh, on linear regression, right? You have this one over sigma times square root uh, of n number of terms. So when, when you don't have enough data points, then this, the minimizer will be somewhere over here or somewhere over here. Um, like that. Only when you have sufficient number of data points, then you, you can control that so that it, it, it will stay sufficiently close to, to, uh, to the WX axis. Now, you can further, you know, have a, a little bit more precise uh, information about this thing. Um, so the, the time to escape in, in case that you get attracted, attracted to somewhere near the origin, then it will take you this much time uh, to escape um, and, and resume your path. And that's related to the standard deviation of your, your noise in the y direction. And uh, once you get to the slow manifold, somewhere close to the slow manifold, you will take another you know, equal amount of time um, you know, to, to, get, to, to be attracted to the, to the optimal um, weight sets like that. So this is confirmed, or this is illustrated by the, the diagram over here um, on the lower left corner. Um, so the horizontal axis shows you in some unit the number of time steps uh, you, that you perform in your discrete uh, gradient descent uh, flow. 
you have a network that with L equals to 10. So you have 11 uh, or 10 hidden layers. Uh, this is a standard deviation. And this is the, the blue curve shows you, uh, you know, the, the L2 difference between, um, you know, what is what you're being computed, what's being computed and the optimal weight set. So you start off from here. And then this plateau uh, corresponds to the fact that you are trapped over here uh, in the neighborhood around uh, the origin. And then once you escape, you quickly get you, you quickly get to some neighborhood of, of the slow manifold, and then you start to be attracted to the slow manifold, and then also be attracted to, uh, and, and flow down or up towards the, the optimal way sets like that. So that that tells that gives you this uh, behavior, and you know if if you have listened to some uh, you know uh, deep learning talks, uh, this kind of uh, picture uh, is not uncommon. And we, we see this in, in, in this particular simple uh, setup already. Uh, so this is just another thing when you, you know, we, we plot out the, 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 the trajectory uh, of uh, W1, W2 and the weight, you know, the, and, and the dashed line indicated the optimal values that it should be. So it's just, just a, you know, we, 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 we rip this, the components of this L2 norm uh, apart and then you will see something like this. So I, I won't dwell on that. I will just keep going. Uh, so what can we generalize? Well, so the first thing that we can further prove is that, uh, you know, uh, if, if there's noise and the noise is satisfied, you know, uh, and, and uh, you know, the noise is uh, uh, scaled this particular way, right? Um, with uh, standard deviation sigma, and this is invertible, the correlation matrix is in invertible, then um, with very high probability, Right? So for this multi-layer linear neural network, uh, the, the magnitude of this uh, weight set uh, will be bounded above by a constant, depending on the function you try to learn and your data sets. Uh, but the, most importantly is this guy, this one over sigma times square root of n that we see from the simple exercise involving linear regression. Okay. Now, um, what about you know, kind of the effect of network depth. So uh, this this parameter L, right? That that tells you how many hidden layers there there are in in a neural network. Um, so with, without uh, writing the theorem, I, I thought it's faster to just show uh, from this simple pictures over here. So you see that uh, so on the left diagram refers to a face portrait of. Uh, you know, of a neural network with five hidden layers, and the right one has, uh, you know, has uh, 100 uh, hidden layers uh, like that. And then you see that the, you know, the, the slope of these arrows uh, differs quite a lot, right? So if you initialize from here, let's say somewhere over here, then you will get to somewhere because the gradient is, uh, of these uh, arrow is bigger. So you will get to a somewhere much smaller than when you initialize at the same spot. And then, uh, with, but th then you 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 know for a, a network with a fewer hidden number of hidden layers. So then this way we uh, this this is uh, what we refer to the uh, as the regularization effect uh, coming from uh, this uh, uh, network's uh, depth. So in this regard, uh, you see that the, the more layer you have, it, you know, if you initialize in the right half plane in two D, then um, uh, the smaller in magnitude, this uh, wy would be, uh, which means that when you try to evaluate your functions uh, at a point that's outside of your original data distribution, then um, the performance or or the behavior of this function is is it will be uh, it will be more controlled in this manner. Um, and if you if you um you know unfortunately if you initialize in this strip over here then you will see that actually there's side effect to the network step the, the, the deeper it is then uh, you you know your end uh, optimizing wy would would not be optimal because it will create a large normal derivative for for your learned function learning function so this picture is over here in 2d uh, can be generalized into uh, the general setup. And um, I will describe it uh, from this diagram over here. So, uh, you know, this will denote, uh, you know, R D dx plus dy. And uh, your, the, the stationary manifold, this, that white chalk line uh, 
uh, wall corresponds to uh, this uh, line over here, uh, denoted by gamma zero. And uh, then there's a cylinder. Um, so the, the plane here would correspond to RDX and the vertical direction will correspond to, the, to, the, to RDY, okay? And then there will be a cylinder which, is, which tangents this uh, uh, stationary manifold gamma zero. And then there's also a hyperplane kind of partitioning RDX plus DY into two disjoint uh, uh, sets. This region will be analogous to uh, this side this half plane. And this region over here will, will uh, relate to the other half. And this little strip between the origin and the stationary manifold will correspond to uh, the region enclosed by the cylinder, like that. Uh, it's not a direct generalization in the following sense. So what we can prove is that if you initialize uh, in U plus this half of the uh, space, and if the trajectory doesn't cross this cylinder, then you have the right regularization effect as depicted over here. If it crosses uh, this cylinder, then uh, we currently, we, we cannot say too much. However, if you initialize within this cylinder, um, then we can, you know, then we can say for sure, we can prove for sure that you would have this side effect in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the sense that the magnitude of this weight set WY will grow as, uh, you, uh, as time increases as it, when you do perform the gradient descent. Okay, now we move on to nonlinear networks and we start out simple by, you know, considering uh, a nonlinear network with just one hidden layer and, and by considering uh, the nonlinearity to be a particular kind, particular but popular kind. So um, again, this is the data and we assume that there's no noise. Okay, so this is the data set and the network, the, the kind of functions that we are going to consider, you know, is uh, just this way. So there is a affine transformation from your input vector x you know, and y. And then you, so this is a picture, uh, this is a cartoon depicting this kind of construction. So, and then you activate or you apply nonlinear, a nonlinear function to each one of the com components in the resulting vector. And then you apply another linear transformation. This square over here is a parameter, not uh, you know, not really square, right? This number two is just to, to denote uh, these. Uh, this is the weight related to, you know, uh, related to processing information from this blue layer to the green layer to the final output layer like that. And this is the bias related to the, the to the second, at, you know, to, to, to this process, the second stage of the process like that. Um, so here you see that uh, we assume that we have already trained it, right? And one thing we realize that if, if you have this situation similar to the previous, uh, uh, you know, uh, scenarios, there is a set of weights uh, that are not trainable because your your you, your data again because your data doesn't allow them uh, allow them optimization to see how the effect of variation of this uh, weights to the outcome. Um, so. This kind of untraining weights uh, are denoted or, or are shown here in blue. Um, and they depend solely on the initialization process. Um, and the weight set that has uh, an, an overline or bar above it um, are part of the, you know, are computed, are optimized. So they are the one that's, you know, come after properly training your neural network like that. So uh, this is the picture. So we start to analyze what happened uh, in each one of the so-called neurons, right? each one of the components in the vector, that the resulting vector after you, you apply this comfort, uh, transformation like that. So the ith neuron over here, we start to analyze this thing. So the first thing you see is that, uh, that we realize is that, well, um, 
this blue thing, WIY1 times Y over here, uh, actually, you know, uh, they incur a shift uh, of, uh, you know, of this function, alpha applied to this thing. Right, they incur a shift. So if we consider in particular this alpha being a, what is called ReLU, which is just uh, taking a maximum between zero and the input uh, argument, uh, then this is the graph of this function, right? So it's, it's like this. And uh, because of the presence of this guy, uh, this function is gonna be shifted, right? And the, the way it, it's shifted to the right or to the left, it depends on the sign of uh, this guy and this guy and how far uh, the sign of this and, and this, and then how far you go. It depends on the bias like that. So there's a shift over here. And because of that, we can then analyze. Um, so th this is when, when we evaluate the trained function on, on, the, on the data manifold. So y component equals to zero. And we would like to see how it would change if I how, how, how this would differ, right? If, if now we, we evaluate as some y, that's not zero. And that would be the sum of uh, all, the, uh, you know, all the resulting output from each one of the, these neurons. So that, you know, we will just sum it up like that. And, and that's what it says over here, right? So, each, so this will be the, the, the output of the, each neuron in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the hidden layer. Now, we can compare this, and because ReLU is so simple, we can actually say that the following. So the, the space RDX will be, you know, basically there will be three, uh, three disjoint regions in, in this RDX. Um, and uh, this EI will take on three different uh, values uh, in each one of the regions. So above that, so basically, so, uh, you know, the first, uh, the, the first hyperplane over here is denoted by this guy. Right, the first part. And then the second half hyperplane is this guy shifted according to uh, this uh, weight set that uh, you, you, you cannot control and according to how it, you know, where you want to evaluate this Y. So that determines the shift of this uh, hyperplane like that. Like that. And uh, in the pink salmon color region would be uh, when this is positive. And when this is positive, uh, this is also, so, so this means that both of these are positive. Then uh, they are just linear functions. So this will become, becomes identity, identity, and then you can just subtract them. And, and this is what you get. You know EI uh, equals precisely this. And in between, uh, this guy is positive and this guy is negative. So it becomes zero. And then, so that's why you have this guy. Um, and uh, you know, in the third uh, partition, uh, both are activated to be zero. So, you know, you have nothing but zero. So like that. So then you can piece these things together. And that, that's how we can get some kind of precise uh, formula for, for the, the, the outcome of uh, each one of the uh, neurons in the hidden layer. Now we can uh, first, we can further generalize this result uh, to multiple layer, uh, uh, so-called deep ReLU networks. So a, a network that's activated by this kind of uh, ReLU activation that have multiple internal layers, hidden layers. And as, because they are defined uh, recursively, right? So we can rely on this, uh, the recursion. We have just analyzed this guy. And then we can, you know, by th through the recursion, we can get uh, this very simple uh, uh, inequalities relates one, you know, the change in one layer to the change in another layer. Um, and these weight sets are, you know, just coming from optimization. So you can treat them as predetermined uh, factor uh, like that. So uh, using this kind of relations, uh, we are able to prove something like this. So uh, how your function will vary uh, in the normal direction will be uh, bounded above by something like this. There's a product of, uh, you know, norms of ma matrices that just come from the optimization. So this is uh, nothing that we can control. What's interesting here is that uh, then the other factor will depends on say, uh, so here it's quadratic uh, to, uh, to this quantity here, and this is cubic. 
And furthermore, um, it depends on this uh, the spatial gradient of this function hij, which is you know what you know basically the you know what happens after you pass your input to the first hidden layer before you activate it, uh, after you activate it. Uh, so somehow the spatial gradient, you know how this function change with respect to your input vector is important in this guy over here, like that. Now, uh, so we would say that uh, if this quantity is small, then the function that you create, the learning function will be more stable when you try to evaluate it on points away from your original data dis distribution. And this picture here uh, just, uh, you know, um, you know are, are just reflecting on, you know, uh, some additional idea that, you know, what happened, so this is the situation when there's no noise in the data set. So now what happened if you put some noise in the y direction? So um, then, um, you know, we can say that uh, we can think about how, what are the possible mechanisms that one can use to uh, oh, I'm, I need to finish uh, pretty soon. What, what kind of mechanism that we can use to, to improve the stability of this thing? And I'm pretty much uh, done uh, like this. So one, one, uh, one possibility is to, to regularize the functional that we try to minimize. And the other, the other approach would be try to add additional noise uh, to the data sets as uh, you know, in the linear case. Um, and th they just confirm that when you add uh, noise to the data sets, uh, then uh, um, it, it does kind of uh, provide some uh, stabilization effect. But when you add noise, in general, if you have no idea of the distribution or which sub subspace your, your data really is uh, lies on, then you, you know, one strategy is just to add noise everywhere in every dimensions. But this way you will incur, you, you will result in some kind of loss of accuracy. Um, and, and this, we call it an accuracy and stability trade-off, right? You add some noise to stabilize, provided that you have a lot of data points, but uh, on the same time, you, uh, you also may possibly, you know, in increase uh, some, some uh, loss of uh, accuracy over here. And this adding of noise um, actually corresponds to a common practice in, um, in image analysis where they try to rotate, they try to enlarge a given image database by adding some noise to the, to the images or doing some rotation of the images. And this is called data augmentation. And they can be interpreted as adding noise to the original data sets like that. Now, I will not, you know, waste, I, I will terminate uh, by saying that, uh, so, so far, there's no theory, no, no precise formula on the effect of adding this noise to stabilize a, a deep nonlinear network. But one can see that uh, empirically from the experiment, um, the number of uh, data points that you need in order to achieve the stabilization effect has a different scaling now. Right? It's more severe. So in the linear network, uh, as well as uh, regression, linear regression, this beta equals to one. But from our experiments, uh, if you have ReLU activated neural, deep neural network, this beta seems to be close to and uh, bounded above by one half, which really means that uh, you need to have a lot of data points. Otherwise, you would not be able to have a, a very stable evaluation of your neural network. OK, so this is the summary. So uh, I, I hope that I describe in this talk uh, some kind of is, you know, some challenges in the context of uh, machine learning, in particular deep learning, when your, uh, you know, when your data sets uh, really are some lower, lies on some kind of lower dimensional manifold, but artificially embedded in the, in the high dimensions. Because of this embedding, this co-dimension, the existence of this co-dimension, then uh, some additional challenges uh, emerge like that. Um, so, uh, I think finally, maybe I will show this. Uh, uh, I will show this thing over here. So, in general, what happens if you you have uh, you know your your data manifold has curvature? And uh, what happens when you don't know this and you add too much noise, and then there will be you know some kind of limitations due to the geometry of this data manifolds that might come out, and that might render ill conditioning of your resulting optimization problem like that. So you need to know your data well. 
Um, and, uh, you know, in fact, there are work uh, that try to exploit this kind of sensitivities um, and try to create uh, examples uh, and, and that will fold the neural network. And this is called adversarial attack. Um, so, uh, well, in conclusion, you know, uh, one needs to understand the geometry of the data much better. Uh, you know, it's not a panacea, right? This deep learning thing is not a panacea. You just throw everything into this thing and then you optimize and you get something good. Um, so uh, with that, I stop. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, any questions from the audience? So I have a couple of basic questions. So okay. on uh, page five, when you uh, show that uh, for different algorithms, one can get mm -hmm. different uh, manifolds, uh, in what sense are they uh, all correct? There, there, there's no correctness in this thing, okay? So this, this is, uh, you know, you, you, you apply some kind of nonlinear procedure mm -hmm. and, it, and then you're able to project these kind of data points from 784 dimension into three dimensions. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that, so, so in the context of, let's say classification, meaning that you want digit zero to be digits to, to yeah. be called digit zero. So then of course, in this, this, in this sense, then you would like your data points, say, suppose the red are corresponds to digit zero, and then you know, some other colors, say the green corresponds to digit one, you would like these data points of the same label to be grouped together and mm -hmm. to be somehow more separated. That's number one. Mm -hmm. And number two is that, well, this, you probably get a sense that uh, in the end, this kind of uh, procedure over here resembles a lot from just doing some, uh, uh, you know, just doing uh, this square fit in some, you know, in some basic case. In fact, in the early days when they do this classification, you are looking for a hyper hyperplane that cut through the, your, your embedding space and into two disjoint set and one set correspond to one set, one, um, one class and the other set will correspond to mm -hmm. the other class. Like, it do, is this digit zero or not like that? Mm -hmm. But it turns out that the distribution of this uh, digit zero, right, in this case, or in more challenging uh, kind of data sets, the distribution is, they call it, you cannot be, they cannot be linearly separable. You cannot mm -hmm. just find a hyperplane that cut this, make a clean cut. So you have to do, you have to create some kind of nonlinear uh, separations like that. Yeah, I see. Um, right. I see. But I should not worry that uh, the region corresponding to digit zero appear in different uh, places for different algorithms. Well, these are algorithms. So these are not algorithms that is used that are used to classify the images. These are just uh -huh. people. These are algorithms uh, that are used to somehow visualize to get some understanding of how the distribution of points uh, I see. Mm -hmm. Really, are they are not? You know, so these are not strict, strictly related to, say, in in this case, classification. I see. I but see. The, so the projection the, onto uh, this three dimensional space are different. Right. Some so projection are not comparable. You know, some nonlinear projection. I don't even know strictly speaking they are projection or not. Right. There are some mm -hmm. you know mapping between these points to that. And surprisingly, the point is that the the, the reason I select these things, surprisingly, you know they after this kind of mapping, they are still lower dimensional. You know, it's not like you, you get something that's yeah. completely mixed together, right? Um, so, which kind of suggests that there are some kind of intrinsic lower dimensional features uh, related to the distribution of these kind of handwritten digits like that. Mm. I see, thanks. Any other questions? Uh, I have a related one. So uh, from this picture, it seems spectral and uh, TSE um, appear to the best, but um, I think TSE kind of separate better, but the orange and the red are still kind of clustered and a spectral uh, seems um, deal with that problem. So I was wondering um, overall, which one might be a better approach for this task? Well, it depends on which task you want, right? And yeah, so, so here it seems that, yeah, what you said, your observation seems to be correct. But the reason that, uh, you know, uh, I think this is pretty hot right nowadays. Um, but um, I, I think it really depends on what kind of questions you ask, right? So even if you have this distribution and we say that, okay, they lie, they, they are distributed uh, approximately in a lower dimensional subspace. That's what we know. But the 
the other question that I didn't you know, mention is that subject to the function or to, to the task, right, of classifying these objects, maybe this function, this particular function de depends on much lower dimensional features, intrinsic features that you can further extract from this uh, lower dimensional data manifold. So these two things are somehow connected. But so what we have analyzed here is that forget about the functions, right? We just look at the distribution and see if you just, you know, if, if, you, if you just put them in a higher dimensional space and then you have these cold dimension that's floating around and what's gonna, what's gonna happen? And what happens is that if you have no noise, then these uh, code evaluation in the, along these code, in, the, in these cold dimensions, you cannot control it. It just depends on something crazy, how you initialize your network. Right, that's what a consistent a picture that we see over here. I see, I see. Yeah, and then we say, okay, you can add some noise to fill out some to, to test to fill out some of the, these, uh, you know, uh, dimension co dimensions. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but then you have to pay with a lot of data points. But then that also corresponds to what happens. You know, if you look at um, the evolution of the development of this kind of neural network in the in the early '90s or '80s, right? very small data, maybe the result is not so impressive because, I mean, here you see, you really need to have very large data points and that's enabled by modern computing uh, facilities and also the, the availability of extensive data sets. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Cool. Uh, other questions? I have a question. Uh, you you uh, advocate here, the idea of adding more data and adding noise to uh, uh, make uh, learning easier. These days, a lot of people are uh, studying the uh, idea of um, actually over parameterization of your network. So uh, adding far more parameters than strictly necessary to approximate the problem turns out to be useful including useful for generalization. Mm -hmm. Can you please uh, re relate uh, your approach to that one? Or at least I'm curious what you think about that. That is a, that, that is a great question. I, I would say that these two questions are, um, in my viewpoint at the moment, uh, not that related. Because whatever I analyze over here, uh, you can say that I, if I have a very large number of neurons, I could have the, the same analysis goes for uh, over parameterized setup. Um, you, you know, it just, there exists a set of parameters. So I think the striking thing, at least to us, is, you know, they, they come out even from this very simple uh, um, least square setup, right? There exists, when there's no noise in, in the, the normal direction, there exists a set of weights, the parameters that you can never see. No matter how you do, you can never see the vari their effect. Um, and that existed. So uh, this is very different from the typical analysis, even for uh, over parameterized network to, to the best of my knowledge, right? People usually assume that your data points somehow, you know, kind of fill out the entire embedding space. Um, so, it, you know, there's no concentration essentially. So th this is quite different. So uh, I, maybe in the end, one would be able to say something very interesting in this context, you know, over, really over parameters because when we say over parameterization, it, 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 you know, it, it is some regime where you have a lot of data points, but also a lot more uh, parameters like that. But these parameters, if you assume that the data fill out in every dimensions in your embedding space, each one of these, whatever, however many parameters that you have in your network will feel the data points, right? Uh, it's just that you, you have, you, you increase in some sense non-uniqueness and whatever you change the, the landscape. But this is the, we're talking about some existence of parameters, which, uh, you know, without noise, they cannot be trained because your data doesn't see it. And when you have some small noise, then they require a lot more information to, you know, to, 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 to kind of kill the arbitrariness. Yeah. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? So in dynamic system, um, sometimes uh, there are strange attra attractors where there, there is a fractal uh, structure. Uh, are they ever uh, relevant for machine learning? Yes, I actually um, you can find papers. So in particular, um, uh, in uh, 
people try to come up with mathematical theory for uh, natural language processing. So this is a, a case where you want to, in, in, in a sense, you want to repeat. So you, would, you, you, would, you want to have a repeat evaluation of, this, uh, of your learned neural network functions multiple times. Each time you apply it, it, it spit out some fragments of uh, translation. So let's say from Chinese to, to English. So you input Chinese a few words, and then as an input, then it will spit out, you know, uh, some more uh, translation, the corresponding yeah. translation, and then you, you keep applying this, and then there's a memory, you know, in, within the network that uh, remembers, in some sense, that what ha you have uh, piped in. So when you keep re uh, repeating this, so then, it, it, you know, some people study it as a discrete, discrete dynamical system and study the, the attractors or the ergodicities or the whether it's chaotic or not, you know, this kind of thing. Very interesting, yeah. actually. I see, I see. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? So if not, let thank the speaker again for this very interesting talk. Thank you for your patience. Um, I guess, uh, you, you know, if, if uh, any of you have uh, further questions or comments, uh, you know, please don't hesitate to send me emails. Uh, Ying Ying, it's nice to see you again. Yeah. Very nice to see you. Thank you. Uh, I, I see oh, Professor Dolly also. Um, yeah, yeah. Nice I'd like you. to say hi. Um, yeah. Well, I hope well, that you find this.